Okay, I think we've done uh, all that's necessary as far as the technology is concerned. Um, welcome everyone. Um, we'll get on with the, the main business of the uh, evening in a moment. Um, there's one person who's obvious uh, by his absence tonight, and that's Mike Brown. Uh, Mike is indisposed, uh, but I gather he's online uh, this evening, so uh, uh, he'll be back with us soon. So I, I wish him all the best for a speedy recovery. Um, the um, other bit of news, society business, two weeks time, the lecture will be Bruce Lavelle, and Bruce will be talking about the Portasque Tillite and its importance to uh, global glaciation thinking and uh, the huge amount of new work that's been done on the Port Askeg. Um, that lecture is preceded by the annual general meeting, which you should have had the paperwork for. So we'll deal with that and then uh, uh, get on to the that evening's lecture. Tonight, we're back on the theme, I suppose, of uh, pending chapters for the, the new uh, geology of Scotland. And uh, we've had a double act before in this context. Tonight, we've got a sort of uh, carboniferous triptych, I suppose I could call it, um, which is not to say anything about the age of the participants at all. It's just the, um, uh, perhaps it says something about the length of their expertise and the range of their expertise. Um, in terms of this new volume, I think the Carboniferous is perhaps one of the most challenging chapters to really capture um, the breadth, the diversity, the uh, uh, just simply the geology of the Carboniferous, and particularly all the um, new discoveries, the new uh, insights that have become apparent in the last couple of decades since the fourth edition. So um, it is a chapter that has taken an incredible amount of work to bring together. And three of the authors are with us tonight. So we, we have uh, uh, all three of them gone to present their uh, reflections on the, the Carboniferous uh, and the Carboniferous of Scotland. So Alison, Tim and Dave Millward, they're all familiar faces, I think, to the Edinburgh All Sort audience. Uh, but I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to welcome them all tonight and uh, thank them uh, for pulling together, um, uh, uh, shall we say, a representative sample of everything that's gone into the, uh, uh, the chapter for the volume. And of course, I encourage you to get the volume and read the whole thing in due course. Um, so I don't think there's anything more from me needed, really. The Carboniferous of Scotland advances in the last 20 years. Alison. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Can people hear okay? Is that working? Okay, so let me get started. So um, yeah, as, as Graham has introduced, um, we're going to do a three part presentation. So I'm going to start off by talking about the tectonics and basin evolution of the carboniferous in Scotland. And then Dave is going to talk about um, world class fossil finds that we find in the carboniferous of Scotland. And then Tim is going to come and talk about the paleogeography, climatic changes, and vegetation changes. <laughs> it's okay. Um, and then I'll just finish off with one slide on future opportunities. And um, we, we looked when we were planning this talk um, to give a, a kind of representation of the whole Carboniferous, but really we, we couldn't. Um, and so what we've done is we've picked out three topics. And so I do apologize for those people who've maybe come to hear a lot about the volcanics, that we're not going to talk about the volcanics today. Um, there's also, there is a huge amount in the chapter about um, the, the detail of some of the sedimentology and the paleogeography um, that we're also not going to talk about. Tim, Tim's going to talk about some of the regional aspects, but the more local aspects, which is in the book, we're not going to go through that today because we'd be really talking fast. Um, and actually, Graeme said there was three of us in the room that were, were authors, and actually there was four because Graeme is also a co-author on this chapter and, and Mike is online. So um, they've also contributed to this. 
Okay, so I'm going to start with a really big scale plate tectonic setting of where we were in the Carboniferous. So these are three diagrams um, from a paper by Adele in, in 2018, looking at the paleomagnetism. Um, and what you can see uh, on these three things are where, where the UK and Scotland was at the beginning of the Carboniferous, end of Onium, beginning of the Carboniferous, in the middle of the Carboniferous, in the middle diagram, and the, the, towards the end of the Carboniferous into the early Permian um, on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, so just to summarize really what these diagrams are showing, the, the diagram uh, on the left-hand side, which is in, in the lowermost parts of the Carboniferous, um, the, the really colorful bits um, are what became the Variscan orogeny. And you can see that in the, um, the, the other diagrams here. I'll try and use a pointer. So, so to the south of the UK, um, there is a complex orogeny through the Carboniferous called the Vriskan orogeny. Um, and Scotland in particular sat in the foreland of that orogeny. Um, and a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about in more detail um, relate to how the different big tectonic plates were moving at that time, and also the smaller tectonic plates within this really big scale setting of, of the collision of Gondwana in the south and La Russia in the north. Um, one thing that's noticeable on these diagrams as well that I want to point out is on this diagram, um, the UK, roughly speaking, is sitting at 30 degrees to the south, to the south of the equator, whereas by the time we get into the middle of the Carboniferous, this line here is actually at zero, so it's, it's sitting at the equator. So over this time, um, these, these whole um, tectonic plates and microplates moved northwards, and that really influenced the, the climate that we see in the Carboniferous. So, so in the... Uh, the, the earliest Carboniferous, um, you can see on this diagram, if you tilt your head, um, the uh, Caledonian structures in, in Scotland, which are structures like the Great Glen Fault, the Highland Boundary Fault, are on this diagram. And they're really important structures that control um, the basins and uh, the tectonic evolution of these areas. And that's why they're on these diagrams. In the middle of the Carboniferous, we can kind of see a belt where we see sort of um, arrows going sideways, these uh, indicating sort of oblique slip motion. Um, and then the final slide, which is actually after the risk and orogeny ended, we start to see extension after the orogeny. So really these slides are just highlighting there's an awful lot going on at different times through the Carboniferous in the big plate tectonic scale. And then if we move on to the next slide, this is just like zooming in a little bit more into that diagram to look at the tectonic plates. And this is a model that Coward developed in, in 1993, where um, the different microplates are shown on this and some of the big scale structures. And again, this is a diagram from um, the latest Devonian or into the early Carboniferous. And you can see again, the influences of these major structures and particularly the Great Glen Fault and so on. And at this time, it's understood that there was left lateral or sinistral strikes lift on some of these big structures. And then further to the south, um, we see more extensional basins. And then even further to the south, we see these risk and orogenic events. And then at that same sort of scale, again, looking towards the end of the Carboniferous, what had happened, these Variscan orogenic events um, had kind of come to their culmination to the south of the UK. Um, and the faults and, and structures more in the north of the UK were moving in a dextral or right lateral strike slip motion. So one of the kind of key things that's maybe happened in the last 20 years in terms of the tectonics is understanding this big scale plate tectonic picture and understanding that in the, the basins of Scotland, we're seeing not simple uh, extension of basins, not, sim not simple closure of basins, but kind of um, an evolution of oblique slip motions uh, that are going um, either left laterally and then right laterally, combined with events that are extensional and compressional. And really what that means is over the years, people have come up with lots of different tectonic models for say the Midland Valley of Scotland. 
And really, uh, at some level, many of those people are right. But what we've been able to do over the last 20 years is, is pick apart more in time when those events happened and more closely pin down those different events. One way we've been able to do that is because we've been able to look much more regionally than we were able to do before. So focusing on this diagram, which is on the left-hand side, um, the kind of uh, gray green color is the extent of the Carboniferous that we now understand um, is under the North Sea, um, as well as onshore in the Midland Valley of Scotland here, um, and as well as in Southern Scotland and Northern England. So previous to this, our, our understanding of what was offshore was a lot uh, more patchy. Um, and there were uh, people that are sitting in this room who've done a lot of work on uh, particular areas of that. But we have done work over the last 20 years where we, we really look really regionally and looked at these basins. And what we see there is that, again, we see in the highlands, we see the um, influence of these colloidinoids, uh, major fault structures that run um, northeast, southwest, roughly, uh, the Great Glen Fault and Highland Boundary Fault and the Southern Uplands Fault. And then in areas like the Midland Valley, we understand much more now about the complex nature of these basins, that they're not simple extensional like half graben basins, um, but, but the, these basins have a strong influence by strike slip uh, features. And also there are major structures within the basin so, for example, some of these east-west faults are really major structures within the basin. And on, on the right-hand side is an example of a seismic line from the Firth of Forth. So that's it's running across this, this basin here in the Firth of Forth. And just one of the things to point out on this is, is these deep sedimentary basins. This, is, um, this basin goes to about five, six kilometers deep full of carboniferous sediments. Um, these basins were growing at the time that the sediments were deposited. So if you look at this yellow package, which um, is, is a horizon, the passage formation in the upper part, towards the upper part of the Carboniferous, you can see that the strata thicken into this syncline center. So that syncline was growing as the sediments were deposited in the middle of the Firth of Forth. And if we look on shore around that area, there are areas, for example, over towards Burnt Island, where we see those same strata on land, and we can see them uh, thinning onto anticlinal highs, and then we can see them on faults, uh, thinning across faults as well. And then there's a different structural style, which is much more like just extensional pulling style to the south of the Southern Uplands in Southern Scotland and um, Northern England. So across what was the Iapetus suture, we see a really different structural style in the Carboniferous across that. And we also see that in some of the other things like the volcanism that we see within the basin. So what we've tried to do in the Carboniferous chapter is use um, new, new developments in the last 20 years, which have been things like the seismic data that we've used, um, improved dating of the igneous rocks to um, help us uh, really get the time element and um, divide up the basin in time. So, so the diagrams in the in the book chapter all have uh, time down the side <laughs> rather than so actual chronological time rather than just fossil time. And um, there's also been improved biostratigraphy and there's been a lot of data released, deep well data sets for hydrocarbon exploration, for example, have made a big difference to our understanding of the basin. And what we've tried to do is look at the basin's evolution in uh, process terms, so what was happening in the basin, rather than in uh, stratigraphy. So when it doesn't go through and say there was this formation and this formation and this formation, what we're trying to look at is how the basin evolved. So I'm going to just zoom into this diagram so you can see it a bit better in a moment. I just want to point out two things before I do that, and that's really these big uh, areas here with the with the vertical lines. So these are unconformities. These are when we don't have a depositional record in the basin. And there's one uh, down here in, in the lower part of the Carboniferous. And then there's one towards the end of the Carboniferous and into the Permian. And what's striking when you do this in time is really these unconformities are really big um, in time. And some of the units we all love and, and know very well, like the lower coal measures, for example, really important unit in Scotland are actually really small in time. 
So, so looking at things in this way gives us a bit of a different understanding about how, how long things took. Uh, sometimes things like the volcanism, what a big impact that's had uh, on the basin, because there's a really big unconformity there where there was a lot of volcanism. So I'm just going to zoom in and just do some very brief summary of, of that, and then I'm going to pass over to Dave. So just zooming in on the lower carboniferous bit of that diagram, um, one thing to note is that the Kinniswood formation used to be in the Carboniferous. The Kinniswood formation is now in the Devonian, um, roughly speaking, and that is a major change. Um, so Dave, uh, it's the <laughs> time of the people to ask about that if you want to know any more. Uh, Dave's going to talk a lot about um, fossils and so on that are in the Balagan formation, which is in the lower part of the Carboniferous. Um, and then we move up through that, through that part, through uh, a lot of volcanism that we see. I'm looking at Arthur's seat behind me and Arthur's seat's on here. Um, and then up into the middle part of the Carboniferous where we start to see a lot more sedimentation um, from uh, deltas to um, um, the oil shale lakes um, into much more fluctuating sea levels where we see alternating sequences. Tim will talk a bit more about those paleogeographies. And then finally, the top part of that diagram, the, the top bit of the Carboniferous, um, in, in what is uh, the middle Carboniferous break in the, in the Carboniferous timescale between the, what they call the Mississippian and the Pennsylvanian, there is a global relative sea level fall. And in Scotland, what we see is in the passage formation um, at this time, we see lots and lots of fluvial influx, sandstones and so on. Um, and again, quite a lot of unconformities at this time. So we see that in, in the basins in Scotland. Then we pass up into the coal measures, um, which is um, entitled, the part of the chapter is entitled rivers, del deltas and coal mires. And then we go back into a time when there's some um, major unconformities. There's various types of volcanism that has evolved. Um, and then we start to see extension within the basin again. So at that point, I'm going to stop and I'm going to pass over to Dave to talk about fossils in the lower Carboniferous. So I'll just, just have a swap. Okay. Right. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, a part of the chapter which uh, is right at the early Carboniferous, uh, and uh, one of the innovations of this particular edition of the Geology of Scotland is that each of the chapters will contain uh, a what might be called a thematic topic box. It's a, a page or part of a page that effectively is uh, designated to look at some of the uh, perhaps more uh, globally important uh, items within the chapter. For example, in the Devonian chapter, uh, the topic box concentrates uh, on the Rhiney Chert and its uh, uh, international uh, significance. Uh, and because at least three of the authors of the uh, uh, of the Carboniferous chapter uh, were also members of the Tweed project. Uh, you can imagine that, in fact, our choice for this uh, was to deal with the uh, Roma's Gap, that interval at the, of about 15 million years at the beginning of the Carboniferous, uh, which was for a long time has been regarded as a uh, a period of uh, no. Uh, vertebrate fossils being found, or no uh, tetrapods in particular being found. And I want to talk a little bit more about that and the significance of those in that lowest of the formations there, the Balagan uh, formation. And of course, I'd just like to uh, pay tribute to uh, uh, the people who in both inspired and led 
the Tweed project, uh, uh, the late Jenny Clack there, uh, the late Stan Wood, who really inspired uh, much of this work through his extensive uh, search for fossils in the uh, Carboniferous of Scotland. Uh, and of course, the Clough medalist last year, uh, Tim Smithson, who is very much still with us and still working uh, uh, through a lot of the finds that we, uh, uh, that we found. Okay, uh, I just, as part of background to this, I just want to uh, uh, highlight the extraordinary fossil legacy that uh, the Scottish Carboniferous has. Uh, for example, things like the conodont animal. Uh, conodonts, very important for uh, chronological, um, biostratigraphical correlation uh, of limestones in particular uh, through the Carboniferous and earlier formations. Uh, the animal has only ever been found uh, in very, very few places of which the most important one uh, is in uh, Scotland. The shark and ray fin fauna, fish faunas at Glencartum and Bear's Den are of international significance, simply because the cartilaginous skeleton of uh, sharks is very, very rarely fossilized. And there are uh, sharks there with extraordinary fossilization. The uh, over the years of mining for uh, oil shale and coal, uh, there have been lots of records of the finding of uh, uh, tetrapods from the Visayan, uh, and in particular from the Asbian uh, through the Brigantian, and then uh, higher in the uh, succession. Uh, and the previous volume uh, highlighted the terrestrial fauna that uh, was found at East Kirkton, um, <clears throat> uh, where there was a, a large number of tetrapod species found, uh, mainly through the work of Stan Wood, uh, and uh, also uh, a number of invertebrate species uh, as well. But overall, uh, these here, all of this was known uh, prior to uh, the uh, fourth edition uh, of uh, the Geology of Scotland. And yet virtually nothing of this is mentioned in um, that edition. So we tried to uh, recognize that. The, uh, the Foulden faunas, this is in uh, Berwickshire, uh, and the Mississippian floras of Berwickshire, Fife, and K uh, Kilpatrick Hills, are not mentioned. But they do, of course, mention the Nemurian and Westphalian lycopod floras. Uh, but the, uh, the terrestrial flora at uh, uh, East Kirkton, this is a wonderful uh, uh, interpretation of this by Ewan Clarkson uh, that was um, uh, copied through into the fourth edition. Okay, let's then have a look at the uh, uh, Roma's Gap and to uh, see it. And the whole thing goes back really to events uh, that took place in the late Devonian. And there, there was one of the five great mass extinction events uh, that we've encountered uh, on Earth. Uh, it's a complex set of events basically in which between 70 and 80 uh, percent of the species became extinct. Those are estimated figures, obviously. But it starts off with a marine anoxic event uh, at about the frasnian fermanian boundary, somewhere in here. Uh, and then finally, uh, at almost the uh, top of the Devonian, the Hangenberg event, which was effective, uh, affected mostly uh, the terrestrial environment with a lot loss of lot of uh, plant species, uh, and also uh, great changes that occur uh, in the uh, fish and tetrapod faunas. Uh, for example, the green line here shows the total extinction uh, of the placoderms, the uh, armored fish. Uh, and uh, by way of the opposite uh, change from uh, the Devonian into the Carboniferous, we see uh, great uh, expansion and diversification uh, of 
sharks, the chondrichthians, uh, and also in the uh, ray fin fish, i.e. the fish that most of us eat with our chips. The uh, tetrapods in the Devonian uh, were essentially um, very early uh, evolved uh, sometime during the, uh, the late Devonian. Uh, and we see for the first time uh, arms and legs developed, but they also retained uh, features like uh, a fish-like tail uh, and other more detailed anatomical things which showed that these uh, te early tetrapods uh, were, were effectively confined to the water. They may well have been able to get themselves out of the water and exist for certain lengths of time, but they essentially uh, were uh, associated with the uh, aquatic environment. And then uh, in the Visayan in the Asbian and Brigantian, uh, we see creatures uh, that are much more like the modern amphibians uh, and reptiles. And uh, for years, this period of time for the Tornasian and uh, Chadian, the early part of the Carboniferous, uh, almost no uh, tetrapod fossils uh, were known, just a few scattered bones uh, at Blue Beach in Nova Scotia in Canada. Uh, and then, of course, uh, and, and this gap and various uh, ideas for its uh, reason for its existence uh, were invented. Uh, but it was named after the eminent uh, American paleontologist uh, Alfred Romer. Okay, so. Uh, our work on the uh, Balagan formation uh, in uh, Berwickshire and around Berwick upon Tweed uh, has revealed uh, a tremendous amount of fossil material, not only tetrapods, uh, but also various uh, types of, uh, uh, of fish remains as well. But I want to concentrate on the, uh, on the tetrapods and uh, they occur, the, the, the fossils occur in two major um, deposits. Firstly, uh, at the base of some of the fluvial channels, there are conglomerates. And some of those conglomerates contain huge uh, amounts of obviously broken uh, dollar stone, broken sandstone and mudstone, lots of plant material, uh, but also uh, fossil bone, bone of uh, fish species, uh, as well as a whole series uh, of tetrapods. These are quite clearly disarticulated, isolated, and transported. But one can infer that these, these particular animals uh, lived either in the river or on the river banks. However, uh, we also find uh, a significant number of fossils uh, that uh, are what you might call an association of bones. The best of the specimens uh, is this fabulous one here, which is in the Ontarian Museum in Glasgow, where an almost complete specimen of a tetrapod, of a terrestrial tetrapod. Uh, there's the skull. There's the, one of the forelimbs, or probably both of the forelimbs. Part of the hind limbs are there, obviously the, uh, uh, the spine there. Uh, and... Uh, uh, and also uh, the first uh, of uh, the five toed animals. The Devonian tetrapods uh, experimented. There was anything from four right the way through to 10 uh, digits. And it was only in the uh, middle Carboniferous did we see the first of the five toed uh, animals. But these two are just a selection of uh, specimens. This is what has been nicknamed Ribo, hasn't been formally described yet, to my knowledge, but it's an almost complete skeleton uh, of uh, a terrestrial tetrapod uh, from Willie's Hole in the River Witteda. Skull is here, a bit of the skull is missing, uh, 
Uh, that's one of the hind limbs there. That's the other hind limb there. And these are a whole series of what are called gastralia. Uh, the uh, dermal bones that covered the uh, uh, and protected the belly. They're not all as uh, com or near complete as this, but nevertheless, this one here, uh, this is um, 10 centimeters. Uh, this is a, uh, a lower jaw and various uh, skull bones here and various uh, hind, uh, uh, or sorry, uh, various limb bits uh, here. Both of these specimens are in uh, deposits that are called sandy siltstones. And the sandy siltstones are really quite important. This middle uh, picture here uh, is a slice, polished slice of, uh, uh, of a sandy siltstone from Burnmouth, sorry, from the borehole. Uh, and you can see that it basically is very fine grained siltstone. Uh, with large amounts of plant fragments in black there and some other uh, rock fragments. But on some surfaces, the extensive amounts of bones. And these sandy siltstones are very often associated, uh, that's the sandy siltstone in the borehole core from the Norham borehole, uh, over, directly overlying a paleosol. And you can actually see that the sandy siltstone has penetrated down cracks uh, in the uh, fossil soil uh, that's here. And the fossil soil is also gray uh, rather than the original uh, color, which was probably uh, something of this reddy brown uh, here. And it shows that that fossil soil had been waterlogged. So the sandy siltstone was a, a, has been interpreted as a cohesive debris flow from a flood, a tropical seasonal flood that occurred through either um, uh, through overbank flooding from one of the rivers or uh, from es essentially uh, monsoonal deluges. So this is a complete sequence through uh, the uh, Balagan formation at Burnmouth. Uh, and these on the right are the occurrences uh, of the main uh, fossil soils showing their thicknesses. So these are the uh, thicker soils here, uh, you know, up to about 1.6, 1.8, almost two meters uh, in thickness. Uh, and these were uh, these thicker soils were probably forest soils, but there is an association here with the bones. Uh, of those uh, tetrapods. The Willie's Hole and Ribo and other um, tetrapods from Willie's Hole are approximately in that part of uh, the sequence, again, uh, with the sandy soot stones. <clears throat> the, these parts of the succession also uh, have revealed a number of myriapods. These are detritivores, so there is absolutely no doubt uh, that uh, at least some of these tetrapods were living in the terrestrial realm. So, uh, one of the students from Leicester University um, during a field season uh, was a helper at uh, various locations uh, in our fieldwork, and uh, she's quite an artist, and uh, she's put together this uh, artist's impression of what uh, the uh, wetland environment uh, might have looked like, and the relative sizes and associations uh, of uh, the uh, vertebrates uh, and in some invertebrates uh, in the succession. The T is the tetrapod, uh, the G is the, uh, the spiny sharks. The apex predator here is the rhizodont, a big lobe fin fish, who's the real, uh, the real problem. It's no wonder if you could get out of the water, you'd certainly want to be out of the way of a rhizodont. So the tetrapod is there. The small um, ray fin fishes, the millipedes, uh, and the eurypterids. So we have a, a complex vertebrate ecosystem. Uh, there's at least 
11 species of tetrapod have been uh, identified, and some of these are known to be terrestrial capable. Others were limbless and probably uh, remained in the aquatic environment. The East Kirkton um, Brigantian uh, tetrapods show a distinction, show the beginning of the distinction into uh, amphibians and reptiles. They're not true amphibians, not true reptiles, but they lead towards uh, that. And there is a hint in the Tournasian uh, tetrapods of that same split, such that that split into these two quite distinct uh, forms uh, had already taken place uh, by the Tournasian. Ray fin fish in the sequence are absolutely abundant. There are lake sediments within the Balagan which contain uh, even uh, a nursery uh, of juvenile um, ray fin fishes. It was thought that the lungfish had almost died out at the uh, um, mass extinction event, but there are at least 11 species been identified uh, in uh, the Burnmouth and related areas. Uh, and sharks. Over 400 shark teeth were found in that exposure that I so do with uh, Jenny Clack and uh, et al. at the beginning. But both the lungfish and the sharks have crushing dentition. That is, that they actually had uh, teeth that crushed shells. So they were. Uh, probably eating uh, things like ostracods, bivalves, uh, and shrimps. And that basically the diversity of uh, vertebrates that we see uh, not only shows that Roma's gap at least uh, is uh, somewhat closed, uh, but it also shows that there is probably a more diverse. Um, vertebrate fauna than the invertebrate fauna, which is dominated by bivalves, a few species of bivalve, a few species of ostracod, and shrimps. Well, those of us who, uh, uh, who are sedimentologists rather than uh, uh, paleontologists uh, put together a detailed paleogeography of uh, the um, both the Midland Valley and the uh, Northumberland Basin area. And um, you can see from the key there that there are a huge varia set of variations in the different uh, sedimentary environments and therefore probably uh, also in the various habitats that were available uh, for uh, these beasts. A lot of the central area here uh, uh, sorry, the western area and uh, also in Fife uh, is dominated by uh, the Dollarstone uh, siltstone uh, succession. And there's very little in the way of sand there, very fine, thin, overbanked sandstones. But over in the, uh, in the east, we see uh, the persistent uh, presence uh, of fluvial channel deposits. And here is one. This is in the uh, uh, River uh, Witteda at Eddington uh, Mill. Uh, and um, uh, it's interesting to notice that the greatest variation in terms of sedimentary environments uh, occurs uh, in this eastern area where we've been uh, exploring. And you'll also notice from this map the greatest occurrence uh, of vertebrates. These are just the different types of vertebrates here and that very few uh, so far have been identified except from uh, uh, here. That's the Pedipes uh, locality. Now, I have to be very careful here in the sense that uh, uh, we could simply be repeating the uh, Roma's Gap uh, theory because most of the exploration has been going on uh, in this area uh, and we've only had limited exploration over here. But nevertheless, there does seem to be an association with this abundant, diverse uh, 
uh, tetrapod, sorry, vertebrate fauna uh, with the presence of uh, fluvial channels there. And one wonders whether that is the absolutely sort of set of environments that are needed for the rapid diversification and evolution uh, of uh, things like the tetrapods and the fish faunas. And with that, I'll now hand over to Tim. Oops, it switched it. Can, oh, can you can you hear me? Brilliant. Okay, so uh, thanks, Dave. Um, so Dave's obviously given you a really detailed picture about what was going on in the Midland Valley uh, and why it is such an important part place for our understanding of the evolution of life. I'm going to step back now. So I'm going to try and give you some of the broader context. Um, so work that was happening concurrently um, with the, uh, the Tweed project has allowed us now to actually get a much broader understanding of how the Midland Valley fits into the broader story of the Carboniferous of the UK and the Carboniferous full stop. So what do we know? Uh, I'm going to start off by sort of pointing out what we knew about the broader paleogeography in the fourth edition. And, these things have, haven't changed. Um, we know that the, 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 the stratigraphy of Scotland and the Middle of Valley is similar to that of Northern England, but it has differences. We know that the rivers apparently appear to flow mostly from the Northeast, um, although we're, not, we have, we're really not certain on where the source zone is and actually how long these bit of rivers are. In the past, there's been a sort of discussion about whether the, the, what the fourth approach is basin, was this a separate basin? And was it, or was it linked to the Tweed basins? Um, and then equally, what was the role of the Mid-North Sea High? The Mid-North Sea High is a very prominent structure which does divide later stratigraphy, Permo, Trias and Younger, but was this actually a barrier to sediment in the Carboniferous? So, as I mentioned, at the same time as we were doing uh, the Tweed project, uh, we were, uh, Dave and I were also working on another project that Alison was leading, which was a project called the 21st Century Roadmap Project, Paleozoic Roadmap Project. This was an oil and gas project, and it was focused on trying to come up, understand, to produce per, uh, onshore, offshore correlations of the Carboniferous across the whole of, well, the whole K of the UK CS. So we did the, mid, the, the North Sea um, and also work in the Irish Sea. And it was an opportunity for us to take some of this very local detailed understanding that Dave and I have been thinking about um, in the, as part of the um, Tweed project, and then take the step back and sort of work out where do the rivers go? Where, do the, where, do the, where were the basins? And trying to actually really get the sort of larger prospect. And this is one of, um, many paleogeography reconstructions. Uh, this is actually of, um, so this unit here that we see in orange is the fell sandstone formation. Now, those who know the stratigraphy, this is a relatively, relatively minor unit, mostly confined onshore to Northern England. It has some occurrence in the uh, Midland Valley with the Clyde sandstone formation, but wasn't until we had the Tweed project, sort of the, 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 the 21st century roadmap project, we had the opportunity to realize that this unit, we can trace it all the way from um, the Silver Pit Basin all the way up to east, the east coast of, or just east of uh, Aberdeen. And we really, really realized that firstly, the Midland Valley, so the um, Mid North Sea High wasn't a barrier, um, it did control some of the fascies, but it wasn't actually a barrier to sediment. And the big river system was really coming down the center of the North Sea uh, through most of the Carboniferous. But its onset was really, at, and the 
at this time of the base of the fell. So again, what we this allowed us uh, this understanding has now allowed us to sort of revise and improve our understanding of the uh, the broader paleogeographies of the Midland Valley. Again, this is sort of the the step back, if you like, of what from what Dave has previously mentioned. So this is the Tornasian. So this is essentially stepping back from what Dave has seen. Dave was presented in the previous slides. Uh, and we have an area of predominantly sort of marsh and wetlands. So that environment that the tetrapods were living in, uh, if you were flying over in uh, aircraft or Google Earth, it would probably look very much like the modern day Everglades. So very complicated uh, dendritic environments with lakes and um, uh, uh, and areas of saline uh, in, in true, uh, sorry, saline lakes and um, and very complicated and relatively small river systems. Um, as we move up the system, we then pass away from that marine influence. And again, if you go into the Orcadian Basin, um, you you lose a lot of this sort of marginal marineness, if you like, of the succession. Um, but then, as you further go further south from there. Um, this is the Tyne limestone formation. Oh, is it? No, is it the Tyne? Which one is it? <laughs> we forgot. No, it's, a it's a line. That's it. I always get this too. It's the line formation, um, which appears to be a more marine equivalent of the, um, the, the Balagan. But we know these things are age equivalent. So we've now started to really pull together the large scale um, story. The other thing is we also know that there was quite a lot of uplands or, or areas of non-deposition. We say uplands, don't think highlands here. We, we just know that these were bits where the rivers were um, moving around. By the time you get into the late Asbian, we have an established delta system. So the, the, we think that, that that delta was established in the, with the, the, um, the fell, sorry, with the fell sandstone. Uh, but by the time we get into the Asbian succession, we are now looking at much more of a sort of classic deltaic succession. And this is where the Midland Valley um, picks up some of its influences. We still have the issue, um, and as Alison had highlighted, the big volcanoes dam off half of the Midland Valley for a long period of its time. And it takes quite a significant period of time for the sea to breach over those. Uh, volcanics and then but when it does that it then returns it back to a more um, a broader sort of signal again the sort of this is the, the more your dale like signals we see and then by the the kindia scoutian um, we are looking at a fully uh, integrated succession we're, we're filling up the, the the accommodation space but as again as allison said this the thing that's hitting in here and that you don't really see from this kind of paleogeography is the faults are now starting to reactivate. You're starting to create accommodation space. Particularly the, the, one of the things with the passage formation is it's highly, the, the reason that is so fragmented is it's probably because of those active tectonics going on, the rivers are constantly diverting and constantly having to re-incise their pathway. So you don't have that con, con, uh, coherent um, sedimentation. So I think the key thing to recognize here is that one of the things that's really um, unique about the Midland Valley is you're having, sometimes it's behaving like the, the, the broader system, as I say, the, that you find in Northern England and um, all the way up in the Midland, uh, up the North Sea. And other times it seems to act as its own uh, little sub basin. And a lot of that is to do with when it gets dammed by the volcanics. So the volcanics are very critical to why the Midland Valley is different. I'm going to sort of now just talk a little bit about climate. Um, this is a, we don't really go into this uh, in the chapter in great detail, because a lot of this is in our work. Uh, but the, the understanding of the Carboniferous climate has got a lot more complicated in recent years. So as David alluded to, um, we know that even at the bottom of the Carboniferous, the Tunisian, um, we have rainfalls of um, up to, uh, well, it was a, a thousand um, millimeters per year to 1,500 millimeters, so a meter of rainfall per year, but we're in the tropics. So it suggests we have a tropical um, 
climate. And that's mean annual rainfall. It doesn't tell you when it falls. And again, in the black, and there's really good evidence for very high seasonality. So we know even at the bottom of Tornasian, um, we have really high seasonality. Also, we have, uh, as you can see in this reconstruction, um, the Gondwana ice cap, which seems to be present all the way through the Carboniferous, but it waxes and wanes. It's the, probably the reason why we get the limestones uh, in units like the limestone coal formation, the upper and lower limestone formations, because these are flooding events where you have flooded the whole large area of the continental shelves at, at a glacial high stand, much like the modern South China Sea. So if you've ever uh, looked into the geology of uh, um, the modern South China Sea or the uh, quaternary of the South China Sea, you, the, the shoreline can move by hundreds of kilometers as it gets affected by uh, glacial eustacy. So that's, we, we do have that going on in the Carboniferous. And again, these things we've known for a while, but increasingly uh, work by the Americans have now really started to tease apart what's causing what. And one of the things that sort of come from that is really realizing, and this is basically the uh, advent of climate modeling. So this is essentially using, essentially weather forecasting modeling, changing where the continents are, sticking a glaciation and changing uh, your CO2 and your atmospheric OT values and looking at what the result. And what we're now starting to realize is some of those changes that we see in the Carboniferous, for instance, the drying out at the end of the Carboniferous are probably not due, due to local mountain ranges, but are actually a result of things like the maximum extent of that Gondwanan glaciation affecting the pressure zones and then that then shifting climate zones quite dramatically. And you can see in this uh, uh, reconstruction by um, uh, Tarber and Paulson that you can actually, you're shifting climate belts by hundreds or, well, no, by, by hundreds of miles. Um, so this is what, so again, Simple answer, the, the sort of take home from this is the climate story hasn't changed, but it's just, it's a lot more complicated than just a mountain range went up over here. Um, and um, it's probably more linked to these global changes. The other story that, again, wasn't part of the work that we've uh, um, presented or the work done directly in the Midland Valley, but is a very uh, interesting one and really highlights why the carbon is important, is the evolution of rivers. Um, so this is work by uh, Neil Davis and Martin Gibling, um, and they realized by looking at the huge literature view of the whole of the Carboniferous, so the whole of the Paleozoic, that basically for most of the, uh, before the Silurian, there's not much evidence of braided rivers, so of, of meandering rivers or anastomosing rivers. From the Devonian onwards, you then start to see meandering rivers. And then from the Carboniferous onwards, in the middle of the Carboniferous onwards, you start to see anabranching rivers. Anabranching is where you have fixed multiple channels. So this they link to the evolution of plants and particularly trees. Trees seem to be a fundamental control on uh, stabilizing the floodplain. And as you go back through time, um, you basically forest from floodplain upwards, from the delta plain upwards. And the Carboniferous is at a really interesting point. Uh, the late Devonian and the Carboniferous are at an interesting point where you had the low ground, so the, the deltas were forested. The river systems, the Rapatian strips, the lowland rivers were forested, but the uplands were still unforested. So this is, again, one of the reasons why we have probably have a lot more coarser grain sediment coming down our river systems and reaching into the delta fronts than we traditionally do today because that coarser river uh, sediments get held up in the hinterland and broken down. Um, but that only happens after the Carboniferous. So hopefully that's given you a bit of a, a broader scale thing. I, um, but and shown why the Carboniferous is a really interesting period. I know we've worked in it, um, you know, arguably the, um, we've worked 
in the Carboniferous of, uh, Midland Valley of Scotland for over 200 years, we are still discovering things. We don't have all the answers. We're pretty good at knowing where the coal is, but everything else, there's still a lot more to find. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I've just got one slide to finish off. Um, so Tim, Tim has summarised there. Um, there, there is lots more to find. Um, so the last slide is just about when we got to the end of writing uh, the chapter about the Carboniferous of Scotland. Um, we wanted to think, what is there still to do? I mean, there was hundreds and hundreds of papers that we read and reread to write this chapter. Um, there was uh, amazing work that's been done in, in great detail. But I think there still is a, a number of different aspects, and I put two of them on this slide here. So the kind of aspects that I talked about at the beginning of the slide, understanding how the basins evolve, um, there's still a, a bit of work to do there on really picking apart the timing of some of those different structures um, that control the evolution of the basins. Um, I talked about different types of oblique slip within the basins and extension and transgression. Um, there is a lot more we know now, and I haven't described it tonight, but it is um, it is written in the chapter that, that we understand that a lot more, and, and it's linked also to the volcanism. Um, but what the new data that we've now got has enabled us to do is, is to revise um, maps such as the one um, that's shown on this screen in, in greater detail than we were able to before, to look at the depth and the character and so on of those basins. Um, so that's one area that we think is really important. And it's really important because um, it makes a difference to resources that we get, might use the underground for the subsurface for in the future. Um, so a lot of those deep wells, for example, were drilled for oil and gas or coal bed methane or, or shale. But now um, there's a great interest in using the subsurface for other energy technologies. So geothermal, for example, is one. Um, so understanding the history of those basins, the rocks within those basins, um, and how they um, they behaved in the past and, and what they're like now is really important to, the, to potentially those uses of the subsurface going forward. And then the other bit we've really highlighted in, in the chapter, and Dave has, has talked about extensively, is just, I mean, Scotland is an amazing place for the diversity of fossils that you can find within the rocks. Um, and so there's real um, possibilities still there to find a lot more, to really understand about the, the development of um, the, the biosphere and the geosphere through those times. So Dave described uh, sort of life stepping out onto land with the tetrapods. Tim's talked a bit about forests and um, the Carboniferous obviously was a time of big global spread of forests and the environments that enabled those uh, evolution, ecological and evol evolutionary changes. So I shall be, leave it there, and I think we'll all be happy to take questions from you. And yeah, thanks very much for having us all. <laughs>